Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. I'd like to welcome you to another in our series of Conservationists in Action. And this afternoon, we're really fortunate uh, to have with us two of the three co-authors of a wonderful new book I just read last week. It's hot off the press called Feeding Wild Birds in America, Culture, Commerce, and Conservation is the subtitle, and definitely all three of those subcategories are well covered. Uh, with me to the, the far left is Paul Basich. Paul is a conservation writer and editor. He's an avatourism consultant. We might ask what that is slightly later. Uh, and he also knows a great deal about the duck stamp, which is how I first made his acquaintance. Uh, the other co-author we have with us is Margaret Barker. She's a writer and educator in the Chesapeake Bay area. She's also worked at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We'll come to that in a little bit. And then the third author who was unable to join us uh, because of distance, lives in the Midwest, is Carol Henderson, a supervisor of Minnesota's non-game wildlife program in the state DNR. So welcome, Margaret. Welcome, Paul. It's a real pleasure to have you Thank here. You. Thank you. Uh, the book uh, is, is not what I expected at all. <laughs> it has a, a pragmatic title, Feeding Wild Birds in America, but really it's a, an American history, a history of the American conservation movement, yeah. uh, a great guide on how to feed birds more effectively. I realized a number of mistakes I was making in my backyard in the last couple chapters, and just a fascinating insight into uh, our relations with birds. So thank you for putting this book out. It's wonderful, and it's a pleasure to have you in Shepherdstown. And I thought, with your permission, maybe we would start uh, with a little PowerPoint overview of the book uh, and then move into questions. And I would just let folks know uh, if you have questions for Margaret or Paul, uh, please feel free uh, to uh, send them in. You can uh, type in your question on the, the side of the uh, computer uh, where there's chat and then we will hopefully answer them or more specifically, uh, Paul and Margaret will answer them and I will just read them. So let's learn a little more about the book. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, this is a book uh, that three of us put together, and there is our third co-author in the center of the screen. <laughs> That's Carol Henderson in a forest of bird feeders in Minnesota. He sends his, uh, reg his regards and his regrets for not being here. And we have here, I'll take us through the PowerPoint with help, lots of help from Margaret. Uh, we have here on the left, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture um, uh, net, uh, Biological Survey uh, document booklet that was uh, done in the uh, early 1900s, 1917, on uh, uh, feeding wild birds uh, in the Northeast. Farmer's Bulletin number 621. Exactly. <laughs> Farmer's Bulletin number 621. And we should interject a slight commercial here. The Bureau of Biological Survey, Survey was our right. predecessor to that's the Fish right. and Wildlife Service. Before there was a Fish and Wildlife Service, there was a Bureau of Biological Survey, and this one was done by uh, uh, Waldo H. McAtee, uh, okay. one of the champions at uh, that uh, predecessor to the Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, we have um, Bird Feeding in America, which is uh, Feeding Wild Birds in America, the book, which is by myself and Margaret and Carol. And it started as a small project for the Wild Bird Centers of America, one of the franchise operations that has bird stores. But it grew into a, an entire book because we've discovered stuff that we never knew about birds. And it's a lot more than sticking peanut butter onto pine cones, <laughs> which everybody does with kids and is a wonderful thing to do. Uh, it's uh, it, part of the subtitle has to do with commerce and feeding matters and there's a popularity of uh, b bird feeding in the country in your own Fish and Wildlife National Survey of Fishing, Hunting and Wildlife Associated Recreation in 2011 you determined that there are about 52, 53 million people who wow. actually feed birds in their backyards. That doesn't mean they go out of the, beyond their backyards, which we would all love them to do, but at least they've taken this first uh, important step. And it can be illustrated very clearly through the previous studies on National Survey on Fishing, Hunting, and Wildlife Associated Recreation. On the left, you see the bird food has increased in 2006 from uh, $3.35 billion mm -hmm. in 2011 to $4.06 billion. That's an increase of 21.4% just in that short period. It's amazing. And we're talking billions of dollars worth of bird seed. Uh, folks. On the right, we see feeders of uh, bird boxes and baths have increased from uh, 790 million in 2006 to almost uh, 
a billion dollars in 2011. I wouldn't be surprised if it's already over a billion dollars by now. That's an equivalent parallel. Uh, those of us in social science are comforting to see those things. A parallel increase of about the same, about 22, 23 percent. And as I said, there are about 52, 53 million people freed in their backyards. Um, our book is broken down uh, mostly, as you know, Mark, uh, uh, chapter by chapter, decade by decade. And uh, I'll just run through this clearly. We touch on the start of bird feeding in the late 1800s and the rise of the bird preservation movement, the discovery of, of, um, of bird feeding in the teens and the 20s in particular, the roaring 20s when there was surplus money and you could have luxurious things like bird feeders in your backyard, <laughs> contrasted with the experimentation and duress during the Depression when there wasn't lots of yeah. uh, cash running around and, and freedom to move around and uh, deal with birds, um, even in your backyard, and the growth of uh, the post-war prosperity, innovation, suburbia in the 50s, and the growth of feeders in the backyard, trial and error in the 60s, uh, bird seed preferences in the 70s and 80s, including all year bird feeding, not just yeah. in the winter, which grew during between the 50s and the, uh, and the 70s in particular. And uh, finally, the development of, of a multi-million dollar market uh, and a fast-growing industry, especially since the uh, 1990s. Now, you, you can add, Margaret? And I, I might add that one of our last chapters really um, incorporates all of the different eras, all of the different decades, in, um, in a chapter on birding recipes through the decades. And it's, it was really fun, very interesting to research this and, and find the different um, ingredients that were used through the decades, really reflective of the decades, and the way that things were made, you know, from stirring around in big tubs to using the microwave. So, um, but um, again, through the decades, people have wanted to make food for their birds. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a cookbook also. Yeah. It, okay. You yeah. Not follow, cooking the birds, but cooking the food the for birds. Just another, like they did in 1920. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it, we could have called this culture, commerce, conservation, and cooking. That's what Margaret just recommended. You never know. And I, I would add from the reader perspective, Profusely illustrated. It's yes. a, it's a, Texas A&M has, has put out a book that's a coffee table book uh, in its illustration of wealth, but, uh, but small enough to handle in the field, basically. Yeah, the folks at Texas A&M University Press were fabulous and were really wonderful to deal with. Uh, they took, uh, which was one of Carol's roles in particular in this, in this process of three of us. I mean, Carol took charge basically of the illustrations. We all collected them. Carol collected maybe 60, 70 percent of them, but yeah. we all collected them, and he put it together in a package, and uh, okay. it was terrific. And uh, it, it, it is lots of fun, and we'll, we'll discuss some of the captions. We'll see some of them. Some of them later, <laughs> yeah, but, that's yeah. right. Some of them in the PowerPoint, and some of them outside the PowerPoint. Uh, on the next screen, we have uh, uh, one yes. of the representatives of the year, mm -hmm. the first beginnings. Florence Merriam Bailey, um, and she just had a fascinating history um, starting um, establishing an Audubon chapter at Smith College back in the mid-1880s. Um, and that chapter um, of young women were um, really working to end the feather trade. Um, and then she, um, she became an educator and um, there are many accounts of her using uh, bird feeding um, as part of her educational programs to DC teachers, Washington DC teachers. And then of course, um, she wrote several books. One of her um, uh, most famous ones is uh, Birding Through an Opera Glass. And then, <laughs> yes. the, but in the birds, um, in, a, in a book that followed, Birds of Village and Field, she describes how to feed the birds and then recounts the bird feeding efforts of a woman in Vermont in great detail. And it's really one of the first accounts mm -hmm. of that sort of detailed description of somebody, you know, watching um, her windowsill full of birds, counting the birds, identifying them, telling us all about the different foods that were being fed. So that really was captured by Florence Merriam. I was cheered that you opened the book with her because there's so many connections to our agency. And, and Florence Miriam Bailey um, is, is, is a double connection to us. She's related to C.H. Miriam, who uh, right. her brother. Is, was, yep, 
first uh, director of the biological survey, and then Vernon Bailey uh, worked for us for many years. So um, this is no accident. <laughs> yes. Good genes. Good genes. Good genes. In the opera glass, I just have to ask: uh, Is that because this was before binoculars? Is that why? Uh, oh yes, I don't know exactly when binoculars. <laughs> well, there were binoculars, but you see, people the, were using opera glasses because yeah. they had them. The, the bird protection movement at the turn of the century was also part and parcel of, of uh, elegant northeastern Brahmin women uh, who became incensed with the, uh, those of uh, less uh, stature or, or, or morality, if I might say, that were actually adorning their, their hats with feathers. And so it became a protest movement. And of course, all those women happened to have opera glasses available. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. I mean, everybody had opera glasses, didn't they? Well, not exactly. but. Right. But it, it, it was also, uh, there was a movement, especially when you hit, hit the 1900, 1901, 1903, uh, with the Christmas bird count, to move away from simply shooting the birds and counting them, <laughs> counting exactly. what pile of feathers you had to, simply watching them through, through your glasses, your field glasses, non-prismatic field glasses. Uh, although that became um, much more popular in the, uh, in the decades that, uh, that followed. Uh, Great. The, uh, uh, prismatic glasses. But that's true. That was a statement itself, just the title of that book. Yeah, the title's great. Mm -hmm. It's an aesthetic enjoyment, just like the opera. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, next, of course, we had, as I just mentioned, yeah. uh, the the Lacey Act of uh, 1900, and there's a elegant lady on the left with her feathered hat, and, and the example of market hunting on the right. There are two parallel uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, signs of slaughter and destruction that were uh, tempered by the Lacey Act, and brought us uh, thereafter to things like the, the uh, Migratory Bird Treaty of 1916 yep. uh, and, and uh, 1918. And uh, here's what you were talking about, your very <laughs> question. The, the production of opera glasses and the distribution of opera glasses and the feminization of bird study. Uh, Mabel Osgood Wright and, and Florence Berry and Bailey and other, others uh, who, who brought it to, to the fore. Uh, the Chester Reed Guides, maybe Margaret can talk about the Chester mm -hmm. Reed Guides starting in about 1906. Mm -hmm. These were funny, that's in the lower left, the predecessor to Winnie Peterson's. Mm -hmm. I have one right here with me. Oh. That <laughs> Look was, how small they are. <laughs> this, this was my grandmother's, and it's land birds east of the Rockies. And I have some notes in there from her of the birds that she saw on certain dates. And it's just a wonderful um, collection of material, it's but you can strange see. Strange size yeah. and, and format. Yeah, and, um, and here I'll hold it up here. So, but this was not quite the field guide that we know mm -hmm. that Roger Torrey Peterson really yeah. introduced. But this was the land guide, and it told you all about the birds, this one in particular, in the east. Oh, so um, that's, and a lot of people bought these. And I dare say that a lot of people might find these in family yeah. treasure troves. Um, it is a, it's a wonderful little um, bit of birding history. I think by the history. 1930s, even after um, Chester Reed died, uh, they were being sold for as much as 25 cents a piece. So, <laughs> so, oh, wow. so affordable. But in here also, um, and um, we use this quote in the book, but in, the, um, in Chester Reed's introduction, he talks about attracting birds. So um, it's interesting, so that in this field guide that was 1906, I think mm -hmm. was the first printing, right. um, <clears throat> he mentions attracting birds around your home so that, um, you know, that they might stay around Great. in the spring and the summer. Indeed, and we, we moved past the uh, early part of the <clears throat> century to uh, uh, the teens and 20s, and we get such things as uh, that farmer's bulletin number uh, uh, 621, uh, Waldo McAtee's uh, presentation there on the left, uh, and there he is himself. Uh, of course, as you said, he was uh, with the uh, U.S. Biological Survey, and he even described at the time, and maybe somebody will ask questions later, about the use of coconuts were <laughs> very common. Uh, everyone seemed to have coconuts at the time, and it was very common to recycle coconuts and build them as bird feeders. Um, also, there was the start of the 20s in particular, there were actually businesses uh, that uh, small businesses, Joseph Dodson on the left, his little company um, was one of them, and uh, he he sold bird feeders, uh, weather vane bird feeders. You'll see the uh, the wing of that weather vane feeder on the left, looks maybe the cardinal on it, 
and the wind would, would rotate the feeder so it would stay away from the wind, and the birds would be sheltered inside that feeder and feed uh, voraciously and, uh, and protected from the wind. If you look in the early bird lore magazines, especially <clears throat> in the back of um, a particular issue, you'll see advertisements. And I'd say in the um, early part of the century, or early part of the 1900s, up until the 1920s, maybe early 30s, you've got Joseph Dodson in there almost every time. Um, but he not only was um, promoting and selling bird feeders, bird houses, but also noticed the sparrow traps. Right, he was selling sparrow traps that are on the screen. And on the right end of the screen there, there's also Saunders, 1917, uh, anti-house house, house sparrow feeder. You would, it's like a frying pan and made out of wood. You'd, <laughs> you'd flip it over, uh, pour in seed and uh, suet, and then let it dry, and then flip it over so the chickadees and nuthatches could get it, but the house sparrows couldn't. <laughs> so there was creativity, innovation, and experimentation. Into the, into the 20s. Uh, by the time we reach the 30s, it's kind of tougher. Um, people don't have uh, uh, extra cash to spend on such luxurious things as, as bird seed and, and feeders. Um, you know, when there's 20, 25 million people unemployed, you're feeding your family, not the birds. But still, folks collected, particularly rural folks, collected uh, uh, scratch seed and a surplus uh, chicken feed, and they would collect it and, and spread it on the snow. And here's a particular, uh, what we would call today a PSA, a public service announcement, <laughs> from the Federal Cartridge Corporation in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And it says, feed the birds now. And they're, they have a whole series of these. And particularly, they were showing uh, doves and quail and pheasants feeding under. And uh, that came up later, and uh, we may discuss that at, uh, at some point. Um, at the same time, that what became very popular, um, and we'll discuss this later, I hope, um, was when you bought, when your family bought Arm & Hammer baking soda, or Calbran baking soda, <laughs> uh, same, both owned by uh, Dwight and um, Church and Dwight, uh, same company, Arm & Hammer, you'd get a set of uh, bird cards about useful birds. <laughs> and they would have the, uh, uh, these particular little cards, they're about the size of half of a baseball card, and, Louis uh, Agassiz Fuertes would have his artwork in it, and uh, it's how I got interested in birds. My grandfather gave me a stack of these when I was about four years old, and it was interesting. I collected it and memorized the names. But on the back, it would tell you why the birds were useful, the fact that they were eating you know, terrible insects, and that they would eat weed seeds, and they would help agriculture. Uh, and that was uh, you know, going through uh, those little cards, I guess, started in the, the turn of the century and went at least into the 40s, as I recall. And this notice that this one is on um, on some suet, right? just yeah. on a board there. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's the way suet used to be presented. Exactly. And after Very that time, simple. after the Depression, and after World War II, by the way, there was lots of rationing in World War II, and even uh, you, you, you couldn't eat. To find suet in World War II was difficult because they were recycling suet to make munitions, Mark. Yeah. So even to, and to find sugar for hummingbird feeders was sometimes difficult because they were rationing. We were rationing that. Uh, we have, though, at the end of the war, uh, lots of GIs came home and uh, started uh, building their own workshops um, to tinker. And Gil Dunn's workshop is shown on the left. He was a uh, a uh, staff sergeant crew chief in aircraft repair overseas. He was handy at tools and building stuff, and he formed a company that still exists, run by his son, um, uh, Mike Dunn, uh, and his uh, daughter, Sharon Dunn. It's Duncraft, and uh, my goodness, in the early 50s, he had these Duncraft flight deck, interesting <laughs> flight deck. He came from a uh, U.S. Army Air Force. Uh, maybe yeah. that's why he used that word, a flight deck uh, phenomenon, and he would have the... Uh, birds coming to that window feeder. And it was an interesting thing, and uh, the company is still in existence. And he used a, a creative device called Masonite, a press board <laughs> uh, that he built the feeder out of, and it would probably last a couple of seasons, you know, and uh, do quite well. For five ninety five. For five ninety five. <laughs> for five ninety five. And it would, it would clip onto a wooden window sill. By the 70s and 80s, we had, uh, certainly by the 80s, we had a growth of, uh, uh, taking care of the growth of suburbia, a number of shops that grew up in the uh, in suburbia in particular, and two uh, franchise operations, Wild Birds Unlimited, and then Wild Bird Centers of America grew. And uh, they were very important, and still are important, and are in business with uh, dozens and hundreds of shops. Um, also, parallel 
uh, to that. Starting in the late 1980s, there was an experiment launched between Long Point Bird Observatory in Canada and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology called Project Feeder Watch. And Margaret, who worked on it, will describe mm -hmm. it now. And this is one of the products that they put out. <clears throat> when I came on board, the lab had just received a National Science Foundation grant. Mm -hmm. And one of the products that they wanted to have um, to give to all participants, as well as other people, as part of, of an educational effort to help teach people their birds, was a really nice bird poster in the tradition of the bird posters that had been in the past, or the, um, or the cards, for example, um, because those are such wonderful teaching tools. Oh, yeah. And so this was developed um, with um, Larry McQueen, artist Larry McQueen, whom a lot of people probably recognize. Um, and it was, it was just great to work with him as well. Um, so, but this poster has since been reprinted and reprinted and reprinted. And I don't know the exact figures, but in the, you know, over 100,000 of these wow. are out there. And um, the lab still uses them for their educational efforts. And there's an Eastern poster and a Western oh, yeah. poster. For the <laughs> Going back to the Chester Reed tradition. <laughs> that's right. That's and the right. Roger Torrey Peterson tradition, too. Mm -hmm. and, and that's very important. But we'll take us through quickly three little stories. And these are characteristic stories that we have in our book, side stories about particular products or particular seeds. We'll quickly go through sunflower seeds and Niger and tube feeders, just to give you an idea of stuff that's important but we didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, first, in the question of sunflower seeds, in the uh, 1960s, a guy by the name uh, of Dick Baldwin worked for Cargill Corporation. Dick is shown on the right. That photo was taken in uh, the 1990s, so you can imagine him uh, 30 years younger. In the 1960s, visiting the USSR, uh, visiting um, successful breeding programs, industrial size breeding programs that were going on in the Soviet Union for um, the importance and the development of sunflower oil. And uh, Vasily Stepanovich Pustovoit is there shown on the left, a hero of the Soviet Union for his agricultural prowess and uh, discoveries. Uh, while U.S. sunflower seeds, the old gray striped sunflower seeds, had about 28% oil in them, mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union, this much smaller but much richer seed had up to 38 to 40%. And this was virtually a state secret. There's a whole story about it <laughs> and how Dick Baldwin snuck out the state secret. This is, this is agricultural espionage, essentially. During, Cold War. During the Cold War. During yes. the Cold War. Yeah. Just a few years after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he's able to sneak out uh, the seed uh, from under the noses of his Soviet colleagues. Uh, the end of the story is, though, that the uh, kiss and made up after the end of the Cold War, and, uh, and Dick invited n numerous uh, delegations uh, from Russia to come to the United States to see how uh, to see how sunflower seeds were developed. But the whole story is in the book. There's also the story of Thistle, excuse me, Niger. The real name oh, yes. is, is Niger, uh, now spelled N-Y-J-E-R to, uh, to avoid any particular uh, pronunciation problems with that. And uh, it started with a, uh, a wonderful little book that oh. Margaret has here, Hand Taming here Wild is. Birds at the Feeder. And um, it was by a guy named Alfred Martin. Mm -hmm. Just and uh, there we he, go. he wrote uh, this book in the 60s. Um, yep. He was raised in Great Britain but came back home to the United States. His family brought him back home to Maine. And uh, what, from Britain he brought uh, this rare seed which was used in British cage birds. This, this what he called thistle seed, mm -hmm. but it's uh, Niger. And it is, uh, by the way, grown in uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, and India, and Sri Lanka, and Burma uh, also. But these are the places. And he brought it back to the States um, and used it to uh, attract uh, birds. Uh, it was so attractive to birds, he used it to bring them to his, to his hand, chickadees, nuthatches, cardinals, um, grosbeaks, etc., uh, to the point where uh, by the time there was a, um, a few visits to this part of the world to examine seed by a uh, commodity brokerage house called Burns and Kopstein. A fellow by the name of Joel Rosenthal went there to, and he experimented with bringing that seed back to the United States. That seed in those countries are used for such things as cooking oil, um, lamp oil, and soap. <laughs> but he brought it to the United States to experiment with uh, using this Niger seed, now spelled N-Y-J-E-R, uh, for bird feeders, and it uh, the rest is history. Yes, uh, from the from the late '60s uh, to today, and you see the Niger sock. Mm 
seeds very <laughs> yes. often, uh, or tube feeders with little holes so that uh, siskins in particular and uh, red poles can, can pursue it, which takes us to the tube feeder. Uh, on the left is a picture of Peter Kilhan. He founded a little company called Droll Yankees in the 1950s, I think it was, late 50s. It was a company that uh, uh, had re sold records. You remember records, Mark. <laughs> they sold yes, records I have a few of, in the archive. Uh, <laughs> of uh, bird songs and uh, frog songs and uh, uh, tugboat uh, sounds. <laughs> um, anyhow, he was a very uh, creative fella, and he had a workshop, uh, like many of his, his, uh, his colleagues of the same age. And he was hired by uh, a, a friend nearby in Rhode Island where he lived um, to help him put up a mobile at the Rhode Island School of Design, mm -hmm. one of these enormous mobiles uh, made of plastic. And after the project was over, uh, the designer, the artist, told Peter, he says, uh, well, you can throw these away, uh, these uh, the leftover tubes right. away, and, and Peter, having grown through the Depression and World War II, he doesn't throw anything <laughs> away. So he says, you know, if I put a cap on top and a cap on the bottom and drill some holes and put some dowels in, mm -hmm. I can have a tube feeder. This is 1968, 69, and he uh, actually patented it. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of Peter Kilham and his Droll Yankees company, everybody now has tube feeders in the backyard. Before 1968, there was no such thing, and wow. now they are virtually everywhere of different sizes. And uh, it's an interesting story that we, frankly, didn't know <laughs> anything about. And what's the advantage of tube feeders? Well, the tube feeders, you talk about it, in the book. It, um, mm -hmm. it's, it helps you select your species. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, cardinals, uh, excuse me, starlings don't go on it. Uh, it's very attractive to chickadees and small finches. Yeah. Um, the uh, house sparrows have a hard time getting onto it, so the less desirable species are less likely to use it. Uh, the more desirable species are. And it came at the very same time as black oil sunflower was coming into, <laughs> into play. Uh, the companies that were selling bird seed uh, in mixes had a public that was interested and used to the striped seed. They were yeah. not interested to the small ugly looking, <laughs> small, insignificant black oil sample. Okay. Well, what is this? So the companies had to gradually take out the gray stripe sunflower and slip in bit by bit, <laughs> portion by portion, the black oil sunflower seeds into the mixes. At the same time, the black oil sunflower seeds became perfect fit for these tube feeders, and now we have them. And the tube feeders also keep the seed high and dry, yeah. so that's another big advantage. As opposed that, that to having design. it in a hopper feeder or right. on a tray when they get wet. And, and that's, you know, basically uh, some of the stories. And at the end of the book, we, we revisit the, the common questions that people ask about how we have learned over the decades to <laughs> yeah. take care of uh, the birds in our backyard, how we have learned in terms of feeding. And the lessons are uh, fivefold, to feed birds in all four seasons, to change your bird seed uh, for those four seasons, or the bird fare for those seasons, be it fruit or, or uh, suet uh, or sugar water. Uh, you provide water at all four seasons, even if you have to warm it up with a uh, ele electric uh, heater in winter. The birds need the water at all four seasons. Uh, offer a variety of foods and an assortment of feeders. Uh, provide protection from predators, be they uh, cats or otherwise, or, or hawks, visiting uh, sharp shinned hawks or, or uh, Cooper's Hawks at your feeder. You can uh, provide protection by having a, uh, a brush pile at a distance. And you clean feeders and ground areas regularly. These kinds of rules are good for folks uh, who are using uh, feeders in their backyard, mm -hmm. uh, or nature centers, or um, National Wildlife Refuge visitor centers that often have a feeding situation to introduce the people uh, to feeders, which is an excellent idea because people may be interested in feeders at home and not be terribly used to what to expect at a refuge. Yeah. So a feeder at a, at a visitor center is kind of a transition. So they say, oh, and there are different birds here <laughs> in my backyard. Oh. 
I had their quail here, which we don't have in our backyard. That's interesting. Or they're more different, or their toeys and different species of sparrows. So it's a nice way to, to uh, acclimate the people, to train them yeah. uh, and, and train them into a, a quality visiting experience at, at a refuge. And that's kind of the wrap up of the book, but those are just uh, you know, some of the highlights. Well, thank you for this abstract. And there's, there's much more richness in the book. Um, but we also wanted to encourage participation since this is going out live right now. And we do have a comment um, from Nancy, who works in our Division of Education and Outreach for the Fish and Wildlife Service. So I'm sure she found this interesting. And, and Nancy wrote, this is so interesting, uh, the changes over time and economies and conservation. And I might now use my birding binoculars at a concert <laughs> and for birding, not having a pair of opera glasses. Yeah, we've kind of gone full circle, haven't we? We right. don't really have opera glasses anymore, no. but we all have binoculars. Yeah, we, we bring them <laughs> to the car races, the NASCAR races, and the baseball games, as well as birding, and they're very useful. The wonderful thing about binoculars now is that uh, they, they are once again democratizing. <laughs> Uh, and that you, anyone can get a decent pair of binoculars for 150, 200 bucks. That's that's equivalent to a thousand dollar, fifteen hundred dollar pair of binoculars a decade ago. It's phenomenal the quality that they've gone to, and if you do uh, the right searching, uh, they're easily available, and uh, they are amazing. Uh, to look at uh, some of the old pictures that we had, see those clunkers. Yeah. That, th those, I had those. Those, those clunkers, those <laughs> coral prism binoculars, that, you, know, you got them wet and they were ruined. Um, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and then the expensive ones in the 70s, 80s, and right. 90s. Now, uh, now there's a leveling of uh, optics. Uh, there's an optic leveling, which is wonderful. That's great. And I think it's terrific. We have another comment. Uh, oh my God. I have bird nest boxes that I purchased from Duncraft. I didn't know that they'd been in existence for that long. Yeah, that was interesting. A yeah. lot of these companies start early on, and they're still yeah. with us today. They are still with us today. Uh, that's a good example. Uh, Gil Dunn, uh, having come back from World War II and started the company immediately. Some of the seed companies yeah. have been in business for even much longer. Um, some of them were um, grain businesses. Yep. Um, started in the 1800s. Um, one in particular, this, the name is still around today, is Wagner's. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe they started up in Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> Not where we so, think of a seed no. company. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in those days, they were uh, selling seed to, uh, for people's chickens and that sort of thing. And then yeah. over time, through various circumstances and for various reasons, they um, became involved in the wild bird feeding business. And good for them. Right. Um, it became a huge business, as we learned from right. your book. Oh, Billions yes. of pounds of We also bird learned, seed. curiously, yes. that mm -hmm. during the Second World War, since we were talking about that period in terms of Gildan leaving, leaving the, uh, being a GI and, and going into small business, during World War II, there was an enorm enormous pigeon corps <laughs> in the signal, <laughs> the signal corps yeah. part of the U.S. Army. They use pigeons to, uh, this, this is not texting. Yeah, <laughs> this, oh, no. this is not texting. This is sending pigeons to deliver messages. I mean, there was something like 43,000 pigeons wow. that were part of the invasion of Sicily 19, <laughs> in the 1940s at, uh, from uh, North Africa to Sicily, for instance. Um, and uh, there were lots of companies uh, in the United States that had US government army contracts to provide <laughs> pigeon feed to ship overseas to keep these pigeons alive. You wouldn't necessarily get the pigeon feed in, in England. Right. You had to ship it from the United States. And then after the war, some of these pigeon feed companies had to transition. It was, it was change or, you know, it's evolution. <laughs> you, yeah. you evolve or die. And some of them went into bird feeding, general bird feeding, beyond the pigeons. And they used those skills and those, those uh, uh, particular techniques of packaging and collecting seed, and uh, they had to, sh had to shift from one seed to another, but uh, they were well positioned to, uh, if they were smart enough, to uh, predict the growth of suburbia and bird feeding in the backyard to take advantage of it. Which is nicely covered in the book, how the growth of suburbia really is a boon after World War II to right. the bird feeders. Right. One of the things that's clear, even from the, the brief description you gave us, is the tremendous amount of archival research. Uh, you guys did, and you were kind enough uh, to bring in a few items, and I'd like to go to the first one, uh, which is a poster that I'd never seen before, in spite of it coming from my agency, um, about uh, feeding birds in your backyard from the Biological Survey. Um, 
Oh, yes. Tell us this a little was, about this. Margaret, <laughs> Margaret found this one. She went to the uh, Oh, my goodness. This, this was a quest. Um, so we had seen a little notice in a bird lore issue um, back in the, in the teens that said um, the Bureau of Biological Surveys poster, Feed the Birds This Winter, will be out for the winter of 1917. <laughs> That's all we ever found about this. <laughs> and I was determined, in fact, we could say obsessed, to <laughs> find right. this poster. And it took a couple of years, but I found it at the National Archives. It's not in the best of conditions, but pretty good. Um, and, and here we've got our U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Bureau of Biological Survey, promoting bird feeding. And uh, they're making the connection that if you feed the birds this winter, then the birds will repay you in the spring and the summer by eating your crops, insects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this is, it's a great poster. It tells how to feed the birds. Um, there you've got that historic weather vane. Right. Uh, <laughs> feeder <laughs> feeder <laughs> right exactly. there. And then the, the, big, um, the big one, uh, the housing, <laughs> feeder house, I think they actually called it, there on the right. And um, so it was, it was just a great and glorious day when we found this poster. And it, it immediately preceded US entry into World War I at which time um, people were told and uh, bird enthusiasts uh, and, the, and the Department of Agriculture was uh, telling people to feed the bird as a patriotic duty. Yes. yes. You can feed the birds, it'll cre increase the crop uh, production. Uh, we can defeat the Hun if yes. we take care of our birds uh, this winter. And so you're part of your patriotic obligation. And it was uh, a fascinating cultural connection there. It, at the bottom of your poster is a description of birds I've never seen before, and it says the, the singing laborer <laughs> yes. is worthy of its life. Yes. Uh, tell us a little <laughs> about, uh, that ties into your discussion of economic ornithology and how were, how were birds laborers in the farm fields? Well, there was the case early on um, for economic ornithology. Mm -hmm. So that um, to, to really make the case to protect birds, as one of the cases to protect birds, mm -hmm. then you had to show their economic value. Yep. Not unlike some things we do today. Right. Um, and so, um, so to really further that cause, um, someone figured out that this, you could really make the case this way, feed the birds, and then you'll be repaid. Um, and then that shows that the birds are worthy to live. And then, of course, there were good birds and bad yes. birds. <laughs> That's but, a challenge. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there were the bobblings that eat too much of your good grain. Right. They're the crows that are coming there and eating your corn. They're all bad. You know, they're the... They're the Cooper's hawks, the chicken hawks, who may take one chick, you know, from your from your chicken yeah. yard, from your chicken yard. So, um, you know, there was that 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 perception. But also, interestingly, um, this sort of real emphasis on feeding birds and they'll repay you um, came really in the in the teens, mm -hmm. you know, during before. Uh, or during when the bird protection laws were being passed. Right. So I think that's that's it's really nice. significant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the good bird, bad bird thing comes up quite a bit. There seems to be a lot of emphasis on not feeding house sparrows right. and starlings. Right. Why is there this segregated uh, bird feeder hierarchy? Well, <laughs> they were perceived as being bullies and outsiders, maybe because they were foreigners. Uh, I'm not sure. I hate to think that. But you know, they were introduced birds, yep. and they came to... Um, fill in a much larger niche than anybody ever expected. Uh, the uh, starling was introduced 1898 in New York. By 1940, they reached Seattle. Wow. So um, it's, it's, they, they grew pretty quickly, and they, uh, they evicted many bluebirds, red-bellied woodpeckers, and other cavity nesters. Um, and people were concerned about those. And preceding that, of course, there was the uh, house sparrow, which was uh, brought in because they thought it would eat uh, um, pest um, um, grasshoppers. Grasshoppers, I think. I think. Oh, yeah. Grass, yeah, grasshoppers and, and some pest insects. And big mistake. Uh, interestingly enough, the house sparrow also grew across the country, following uh, very often railroads and spilled grain. Uh -huh. 
Okay. And what grain was this? This was oats for horses, very often. And the house sparrow increased as the uh, horses increased, and it probably peaked at around 1910. <laughs> Okay. And as the horses declined and motorized transportation took over, part of our culture and history, uh, house sparrows declined. And uh, they've been declining in my lifetime and yours. Uh, it's, you can see them in, in suburbia and cities, but they're not as much of a pest as was perceived in the teens, 20s, and 30s, up to the, up to the 50s, perhaps. That's so, fun. I mean, you're tying in a symbiotic relationship yes. here between horses and house sparrows. Mm -hmm. Also, you push back by decades, the interest in invasive species, right. right? Much on our agenda today, but here we, we're worried about starlings and house sparrows. That and posters. I mean, <laughs> for, we, we think that, you know, posters on birds are, are new, a new phenomenon. No, they're not. I mean, it, it goes back to those 1917 poster, U.S. government poster, U.S. biological survey poster. My goodness, and that, that, that was, there were ones previous to that. Yeah. It's not that posters about birds are, are new. It's it's an old tradition, as Margaret said, mm -hmm. when when uh, our friends at uh, uh, Cornell Lab did that. Well, here's here's a very interesting. <laughs> yes, image it is. Here. Tell These, us what we're looking at. This here. is the 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 very same Arm and Hammer Baking Soda Company, um, Church and Dwight, did a poster, uh, which uh, had embedded in it the images of many of their little cards, and we see on the left some, for instance, uh, goldfinch and and uh, Baltimore Oriole, and um, Barn Swallow, and some Warblers, and, and uh, Bluebirds, and Flycatchers, and, and fascinating birds. And these were uh, in this series of cards, how to protect our birds, how to appreciate them, and uh, uh, also very much in the theme of, uh, of uh, good birds and bad birds, useful <laughs> birds. They, they didn't say That's good right. and bad, useful birds. And at the bottom they have, once again, as Margaret just pointed out, in brown there toward the right, one of those weather vane feeders. You don't see those anymore, but extremely popular. And uh, suet feeders and, uh, and how to protect on birds. And on the reverse side of this was lots of instructions for the classroom for using birds for math, using <laughs> birds for geography, using birds for social studies, using birds for science, uh, using b birds for backyard uh, gardening uh, lessons. And this is a good example. And of course, around the edge, around the edge of this very poster, you see those evil insects <laughs> uh, that you have to wipe out. Uh, I hadn't noticed really, that. Yes, I mean, very, very beautifully designed. But there you are. And, and right, some of the weeds in the middle. Right, <laughs> yeah. Right in the center um, also um, are some plants that you can plant for the birds. Yes. Food okay. for the birds that you can plant. So this was, you know, this was part of, of our um, interaction with bird life. Uh, or intersection of our life and theirs, um, and uh, it reflects each of those historic periods. Yeah, and there's something something to say. These cards are really fascinating. Yeah. We've got a couple collections, and and on the back of them is very anthropomorphic descriptions right. of the, the rascally oh, yes. blue jay and so on, the ways yes. we don't describe them. But Wonderful it, parents. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does make you wonder. Uh, and and you alluded to it briefly, but. The, the artist who did a lot of these, Louis Agassiz Fuertes, it's, it's, it's as if John James Audubon did baseball cards. I mean, right. here you have a right. brilliant bird artist with right. full-size paintings. What made people want to collect these things? Where did this even come from? <laughs> it's just a bizarre... I'm not exactly sure. Because it's gone today. Oh, it's gone. There's, there's really no nature cards that no, kids aren't. collect. I wish there were. Um, Pokemon cards, but... Yeah, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> exactly. Not, that's past now. <laughs> right. There, at least there were, but there's certainly no uh, barn swallow and n northern flicker cards and yeah, Baltimore just... Oriole cards, unless you're thinking baseball cards. These were smaller than that. I think it had to do with uh, very, uh, very often with um, uh, educational aspects. These yeah. were distributed around the country. It was a, it was a social responsibility of some of these com countries, companies to uh, to engage in this. And the head of Church and Dwight, Mr. Church, was a friend of Hewitt's. Ah, they were friends, okay. and so it was no. It wasn't like they came out of the blue. He was interested in nature, Mr. Church, and and and, and birds in particular. And uh, I think it was his idea to incorporate it, and it took. There's another good connection. And Commerce another, and conservation can go together. Exactly. <laughs> they don't have and to be mutually exclusive. <laughs> By the way, you know, neither Margaret nor I nor Carol knew a lot of these stories. It isn't that these were generally known five years ago, and they were kind of buried in our history, and and we had to dig them up. And, and put them in the book, all these connections. Yeah, I have yet to, this is the first 
description I've ever seen. We've had those cards, right? But I didn't know the background of them. So I read the book. It raises a good question: Why did you guys decide to write a book on bird feeding? Uh -huh. It's not a typical topic. <laughs> that no, it isn't. Um, I mentioned uh, Wild Bird Centers of America, one of the two franchise companies, and George Petridi is senior, who runs Wild Bird Centers of America. He was um, he is in, based in Maryland. He's a friend of mine, mm -hmm. and we were discussing one day how to get people from bird feeding to bird watching. That is yeah. to say from leave their backyard, go outside, go to a refuge, go to a park, uh, enjoy other birds, get mm -hmm. another suite of species. And uh, George was, uh, was uh, kind enough to invite me to come to the uh, trade annual meeting, wild bird yeah. industry meeting, wild bird feeding industry, to speak about that subject. And I was doing some research to prepare myself and on the history. and I call George back. I said, George, you know, I'm very not finding much information at all <laughs> on the subject of uh, the history of bird feeding. I find bits and pieces. But where can I find this so I'm, I'm better attuned to your colleagues and where they come from? He says, there isn't such a thing. Would you like to write it? <laughs> so I said, I can't do it myself. I have a couple of friends. He says, well, we'll, we'll, do a, we'll do a booklet on it. I'll get my friends. I, I said, I'll get my friends, Carol Henderson and Margaret. Barker to help me because they have as much interest in this as I do, yeah. and some curiosity. We put it together in a 15-page booklet became a 52-page booklet, and then uh, George says, "You know, you could make this into a book." And uh, it took us at least three publishers uh, <laughs> and uh, many years to get it uh, done. But uh, we we hit the right company with uh, Texas A&M University Press. Mm -hmm. They were terrific. Their layout staff was fabulous. Uh, they took uh, a good product that we that we had available and made it into a great one. And that, as you said, I like that, uh, that uh, description of a uh, coffee table book in a small <laughs> miniaturized form. <Yeah. laughs> well, since we're talking about illustrations and historic posters, we have a more contemporary poster that Margaret mentioned earlier. Let's yeah. take a look at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology where you used to work. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little about what we're looking at here, Margaret. Well, so the idea was to, you can see the goldfinches, for example, in their winter plumage. So to really, um, you know, give participants in Project Feeder Watch and other people um, this idea of what the birds uh, that they're most likely to see at their feeders, what they look like up close, what are some distinguishing features, what are you going to see um, in the case of goldfinches mostly in the wintertime at your feeders, although of course goldfinches do come in the summertime. Um, but you can see how um, the, the hairy woodpecker, for example, is um, beautifully drawn and um, is next to the, um, to the downy. So you can juxtaposition those birds and really learn um, quite readily um, some of the differences between those two sometimes hard to distinguish birds. Um, Larry McQueen um, really took his time to um, um, get all of these birds in one place. So that, um, uh, that placement was, uh, was quite deliberate mm -hmm. um, so that you could, could have a, a quick glance at all the birds that are likely to come to your feeders in the eastern part of the United States and Canada. And then um, we also had a western version of the poster made. By the way, I'll add, I'll add two things. First, I've seen this poster at a number of National Wildlife Refuges. We yes. have feeders. <laughs> Next to the, if, there's, if, it's, it's, if it's Bosque del Apache Refuge in the west, they'll have the West, yeah. the west Coast feeder. If it's, if it's a Forsyth Ref Refuge in New Jersey, they'll have the, the East the Eastern uh, feeder uh, poster. And the fact of the matter is, as, as Margaret touched on, this was done in conjunction with Project Feeder Watch that Cornell Lab right. initiated. And Project Feeder Watch was one of the most important citizen science projects that involved thousands of people uh, presenting uh, data on what they're seeing in terms of birds. And you know, after the Christmas count, this is probably the next, the next blip, decades and decades yeah. later, but extremely important. And it prepared all of us for eBird and for other kinds of um, citizen science projects that go beyond birds also. Yeah. Uh, go Let's on talk a little about the, the origins of citizen science. It's something uh, that's one of our service initiatives right now. And, and you guys push that back quite far, too. Yes. What I is mean, the role of bird feeders it, in it, citizen science? It um, goes back to, I think, I would, I would say, the Christmas bird count 1900 and, and mm -hmm. Frank Chapman. Um, as a um, as a lark, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to you know to see how many birds could be counted as opposed to shot. Mm 
on, uh, on the Christmas season and the information collected. And the data only later became useful. And in retrospect, <laughs> we look at it as, oh, this is important data right. that we now call citizen science. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was extremely important to uh, them, and it became important more as the years, you know, the years continued. And I might say that um, we looked through uh, bird lore and some other references to try and find out, figure out when bird feeding first became part of the Christmas bird count. Um, and we did find a couple of references, but we don't know exactly when. Um, so I think in 19, the 1915 report, Christmas bird count mm -hmm. report, it talks about people seeing birds at bird feeders, and maybe a little bit earlier reference. But we're not sure exactly when. So Mark, you're... Your you're assignment. <laughs> You're an archivist. I think that's for the second edition of the, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> the book. But, um, but yes, so, it, so bird feeding was included in the counts early on, but not separated out um, until sometime, I think, in the 70s or the 80s um, as a, you know, as something that you could look at separately. So the bird feeding counts were just put into the general mix of, of bird scene. Cool. And, and People who can participate in Christmas bird counts to this day, as, simply at home watching the feeder and, and keeping oh, yeah. a, a summary of that. Similarly, moving on to Project Feeder Watch, it was a seminal in the discovery of house finch disease, yeah. which was, was an eye disease of, of house finches in particular. Uh, and and uh, it became very um, important. I remember um, we had some volunteers who would read the comment sections um, that people would send in, and they came to us and said, you know, there are a number of people in Maryland who are see seeing something wrong with house finch eyes. And so that started our scientist investigation of this, and um, that led to a multi-year st study wow. and a lot of information on how this particular disease was spread. Also, there were um, birds seen up in Alaska with deformed beaks, and U.S. Mm. Fish and Wildlife Service was involved in this, but it was uh, feeder watch participants. Chickadees, were they uh, Chickadees. Yeah. Um, initially, some mm -hmm. other uh, species were found to have deformed beaks as well, uh, but U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, started an investigation on that, but that was initiated by some feeder watchers who were watching their birds up close, and in intently with a purpose. Very cool. We have, a, we have another comment. Uh, citizen science and STEM mentioned way back when. Very cool. Very cool. Um, that does raise another question. We've talked a little about citizen science, but what uh, were some of the educational initiatives that went with bird feeders? You already mentioned on the back of this particular mm -hmm. poster, <laughs> there's a, a classroom uh, lessons back there in arithmetic and so on. How was education tied to the oh, bird feeder movement? Very often, particularly at the, uh, in the teens, I think starting in the teens, uh, but into the 40s, starting in the teens, there were lots of uh, junior Audubon clubs, mm -hmm. and they were in conjunction with uh, um, educational systems. I mean, there were thousands, I mean thousands of them in Ohio. And uh, there would be uh, kits of, uh, th that uh, uh, the teacher would distribute of flyers and leaflets, and, and uh, bird feeding was included in that, that particular part of the curriculum. And there was also a sentiment, um, not only during the war years, but just in general, that it was a person's duty to feed the birds, especially during harsh winters. And so, um, so that, that was part of that um, perception, to feed the birds. You, you should do it. <laughs> it's yeah, a moral responsibility. It's, That's right. We know now that it is not crucial. <laughs> the birds can survive without being fed. We know that. And I remember reading in the, the early 1940s an article by Roger Tory Peterson on the subject saying that 1934-35 uh, winter was particularly hard in the northwest, northeast, and radio stations from from New York to Boston were broadcasting, and Boy Scout troops were going out because the snow was so deep. Yeah. And in those circumstances, you might have a a particular impact on the survival mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. birds, but. By and large, they can get along without our help. You know, feeding is for us <laughs> more than it is for them. And I think it's wonderful because of that. One of the things that struck me is, is there's not much mention of bird feeders uh, until your story begins around the turn of the century. Right. I, I can't think of a fad that 
took over so long, and I guess it isn't a fad because it's persisted a century later. But do we know at that origin point what really pushed people to do that? Well, people fed birds for utilitarian reasons, yeah. of course. Um, to hunt them. To hunt so them, to <laughs> yeah. bait right. them. Right. Um, we found some early references. There's a reference in 1864, I think, from Thoreau. Mm -hmm. um, but he was feeding. idiosyncratic. But he was <laughs> idiosyncratic. And yeah. he was just throwing he was just it out. Throwing yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, right. That's no longer but, right. but, but so deliberate feeding, no. um, there was a reference in um, the Early Humane Society uh, newsletter about feeding birds. It was a, it was a little story that mm -hmm. was um, but not really, not really that much. Curiously, yes. I may add, we looked similarly, and there's a section on bird baths. Yes. And that goes back to the Greeks and Romans, oh, yeah. maybe the Egyptians. <laughs> and it's no accident, if I can use that phrase again, that a lot of the stands of the traditional bird bath are Greco-Roman right. columns. Right. Revival. Yeah, that's what ours is. <laughs> it goes back to then. We have, yeah. we have pictures from Pompeii of what, of what a bird bird baths in the backyard. So there is, that goes way, way, way back. And uh, the Egyptians were uh, were also engaged in that sort of stuff. But we don't think they fed them. We think it was just the um, bath. Part we of don't it know. Was, was quite the opposite in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, pigeons for the Egyptians. Quite the opposite. They would they would raise pigeons as a, as a hobby and also to feed them. And okay. they'd use baths and they'd use baths as pleasure to feed other birds too. Amazing, isn't it? There were dove coats and all that, <laughs> yes. but there were, <laughs> yeah, but um, but not many references. So we know that somebody along very, put it, put it together. You know that the that the birds were eating the the leftover grain in the in the barn, for example, that sort of thing. Except for some uh, German innovations in the, in the teens, in particular, it's very American. Yeah. Well, the other and, American thing. Oh, go ahead. And it's Let me being it's, it's it's exported to the other Americas. If you go to uh, Peru or Ecuador or Costa Rica and you go to a lodge, there are feeders there. And there are feeders because Americans have come there and they say, well, you know, I expect to see some birds. And so they're feeding you know, sugar water to hummingbirds and, and they have papaya and bananas uh, for their, their elegant, uh, their trogons or their gross beaks or whatever. Uh, Tanagers, and it's just amazing that this kind of practice has been adopted and adapted uh, to in Latin America and the Caribbean. Very American in the big sense. Well, another uniquely American aspect of it is the history of technology and the bird feeders themselves, yeah. which is fascinating. You have great illustrations. Um, and it, it goes to the, the basement or garage tinkerer and so on. That's um, right. But I'm curious, for a couple of these, like the weather vane bird feeder you showed us earlier, what happened to that? <laughs> you know, I don't know. And I have, I've never seen one. I have you know. wondered that as well. I, it is I've a design. I've seen it go into the 40s. When I've seen done. ads. Mm -hmm. National Audubon Society, they had a, they had a, a service department mm -hmm. run by a young employee that they had in the 1940s, a young employee by the name of Roger Torrey Peterson. He was in charge of the service department. Okay. And they had, they had weather vane feeders at the they, time. They were selling them then. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I haven't seen them since then. Yeah, it is curious. The other one with the early ones is, is the presence of evergreens, even yes. like little trees. Oh, yes. I mean, it's basically a board. It looks like attached to a window, a shelf. Right. It's almost right. like a window box feeder. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you actually put one on the, the wild reed book discussion sign yeah. with a little tree yes, yes. <laughs> and there was another one where there are branches. You have, you have a platform <laughs> with, a little, with a little edge around it so okay. the feed doesn't go fall off. Right. You have a little hopper feeder and a and usually little? a hole or a stand where you put a branch a of branch an evergreen. branch or a little tree. A pine mm -hmm. or evergreen. Yeah. And that's, that was the standard, the standard windowsill feeder. <laughs> and was it for humans' aesthetic value, or did they think the birds would feel also, better with a little tree also, there? Some people would also pour melted suet yes. on the on those evergreens, and part of the evergreens so that, to mm -hmm. serve a, a dual function, to attract the, the uh, suet-loving birds, the chickadees and nuthatches and woodpeckers in particular. Edward Hal Forbush, the scientist from Massachusetts, the, the ornithologist, mm -hmm. that's how he had his bird feeding station. He put the suet on the little tree that he had on his board, and then he put out other things like crumbs. Crumbs were really big back in the early days. <laughs> so yeah. using leftovers, and that leftovers, came out of the book. Of yes, course, yes, of course. <laughs> leftover grains, leftover food from uh, the dinner table. Well, before we jump into the 21st century about mm -hmm. best practices, I do have to ask you one other question you alluded to before is um, 
giving a talk perhaps about how to get people from bird feeders into nature. Um, have you found any strategies to do that? <laughs> I mean, how, well, how do we get them on refuges or parks or national I think, forests? I think there are a couple, of, a couple of good ways to do it. One is, I think, inadvertently found by our colleagues at Cornell Lab to have a poster Mm -hmm. so that people can identify what they're looking at. And that, those wonderful Larry Queen posters, the Eastern and the Western, at a glance, indicated at least 90% of the species that you're likely to see, not in a refuge, not in a park, right. but at your backyard. And if people get used to that and get familiar with the difference between a hairy woodpecker and a downy woodpecker, yeah. for instance, or a house finch and a purple finch, and they get to that. When they uh, experience something a little different, they'll notice it. And I think it's easier once they get into the backyard scene to get them out of the backyard and to a refuge. And that's also why I think that some of these feeders at refuges are very important, because it helps transition people in terms of a level of familiarity to a level of experimentation and exploration. Mm -hmm. That's one way to do it, and I think it's right in front of our noses. And I don't want to make this seem like it's just a history book because there's many uh, good examples for how to, to feed and what to feed. So let me ask you uh, the opposite question. What are some things we shouldn't do with our bird feeders that you've learned? Well, we shouldn't let them get dirty. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I think one of the, the really great innovations for modern feeders just in the past couple of years is that they're made easy to clean. Yeah and uh, easy to take apart, you can put it in your dishwasher. Um, that's, that's been, been big and, and makes a difference. Learn how to specialize. If you just throw out crumbs or cheap seed, you'll get crummy birds. <laughs> cheap, bird. <laughs> cheap birds. I mean, we knew this you know, when they were talking about the starlings and the house sparrows. That's what you'll get, and that's probably what you deserve. But if you, are speci if you specialize, if you know if you want to bring in cardinals with safflower, you know, or Proso millet, with, you want to get uh, buntings, mm -hmm. or you want to get particular woodpeckers, you, you know how to put up your suet. Uh, you want to get, you want to get finches with, with uh, sunflower seeds. You want to get later in the season, you may want to get orioles and yeah. grosbeaks uh, with, with the fruit. Uh, oranges and, and apples, I mean, they just love that. Um, that's what you should, you know, you should be oriented toward. and, and as was listed in our five important things right. to do, have a selection, have them separate, and, uh, specialize in them, make sure you provide water. Those are the things you should do. And, and uh, opposite wise, don't just expect throwing out the cheapest bird seed mix is gonna bring in uh, some of the most exotic birds because that ain't gonna happen. Is there a particular feeder structure that seems to work especially well? Well, different birds feed at different right. levels. And so um, the, the hopper feeders work well for some birds that might be feeding only on the ground, of course. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll go up to the hopper feeders. That's kind of a ground for them. Right. Um, so the, and the, then the tube feeders are for different birds, cling, clinging birds. Um, so, yeah. They, I usually recommend somebody who's just, I said, have a have hopper a, feeder, have a, have have a tube feeder, ones. have a suet feeder. Yep. Three kinds of feeders separate from each other. You'll watch, you'll watch how the birds come separately. By the way, seed will drop and you'll see the ground feeding birds automatically. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. This is true. You always That's how them. we fed <laughs> them. <laughs> that will, that will happen. That will happen. <laughs> well, let me ask you both an unfair question. Okay. Having looked at the history of uh, bird feeders, uh, do you see any trends developing in the future of bird feeders? Prognostication mm -hmm. isn't really a fair mm -hmm. question, but I'm curious. No, I see, <laughs> I see what's going on in Latin America as being very helpful and very healthy. Um, and it's not just at lodges, it's to homes, and people are feeding birds in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, which is very good because it feeds some of our birds yep. down mm -hmm. there too. And it also gets them to be uh, concerned about uh, our neighbors to the south to be concerned about uh, the status and the, the safety and the preservation of the birds that we share and the birds that are special to them. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, we're gonna see a lot of that grow insofar as that it, it brings uh, people to certain lodges, eco lodges, yep. I think that's wonderful. And ecotourism is uh, to be uh, one of the ways that we can communicate with our neighbors to the south. Uh, that's a trend. I, I, in the US, I don't know where the next tube feeder is, but I'm yeah. sure there is one someplace. <laughs> I have a friend who has designed 
um, a, and sent me a sample copy of a new style Niger sock feeder. <laughs> and it's a Niger sock feeder that won't get wet and that's easily movable, that's easily removable, that has a, has a sheltered top and is protected from uh, unwanted species. And it's fascinating. And who knows, maybe a decade from now, we won't, everybody will be using it and we won't remember where it came from. <laughs> but a couple of trends in seeds through the past decade or so have been to specialize, um, to have seeds. It, it will, you know, I think Wagner has developed a seed for northeastern birds, southeastern birds, wow. um, that sort of thing. Um, so I think the specialization is going to continue, um, as well as some electronics. A lot of people who feed the birds have, you know, bird cams. Yeah, we right were talking there. about bird cams earlier right. before the show. And I think that's a so they can see and hear when they're at work. People come home and run through their run through their their collected images at their feeder you can see of what they there. missed while they were at work. It's a nanny cam for birds. A, a nanny, oh yeah, there you go. That's that's, that's that could it. be part of the part of the future too. Well, let me ask you one final yeah. and uh, ultimate question that, that uh, underpins your book, Feeding Wild Birds in America, and that is feeding wild birds. Does it ultimately benefit? Americans more or the birds? Both. I think feeding the birds is mainly for people. Mm -hmm. But if people don't care about birds, they lose. So it's mutually advantageous. Um, feeding the birds doesn't save the birds. I think it saves us. And I think that's a way, the way I look at it anyhow. Would okay. you agree, Margaret? I think that, yes. But I, I think it also helps to save the birds maybe indirectly, because mm -hmm. people um, sympathize with them. Mm -hmm. That was a term that was used in the early part of the 1900s, yes. um, that feeding birds helped you see them up close and helped you sympathize with them to gain an emotional connection with them, if you will. And, um, and to see the birds up close, um, as an environmental educator, we used to say, um, you, if you see something up close, if you learn about it, then you're going to care about it. Yeah. And so I think that really transfers very well to feeding the birds. That's great last words to go out on. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you, Paul. This has been a, you, a quick and incredibly informative discussion. I'm sure anybody who doesn't have a bird feeder is gonna go out and uh, put one up this evening <laughs> after learning Please. about this, this storied history. And I'd like to thank everyone who uh, took the time to tune in this afternoon. And yes. once again, the book is called uh, Feeding Wild Birds in America. And uh, Paul Basich and uh, Margaret Barker and Carol Henderson are the authors. And I, I hope you go out and read it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret.